This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, call William Ray Ho. Welcome to Black Sheep. Just a warning, this podcast contains some graphic content which might not be suitable for younger listeners. So this story, like all good stories in 2018, starts on Twitter. Last year I put out a tweet asking people if they had any good ideas for black sheep characters to look into, and someone sent back a tweet with a name I hadn't heard before. Horatio Gordon Robley. So I typed it into Google, and then this photo popped up. I think it's the most disturbing image I've ever come across while working on the show, and I wanted to know what other people in the office thought about it. Test, test, test. I'm in the prod studio. Jamie here. How are we looking? Cool. All right. So, Jamie, I'm about to show you a photo. I need you to look at this photo and then give me your reaction to it. So I'll put it down on the table here. Jesus Christ. (laughs) If you want to see this photo, feel free to Google it. I'm not going to post it anywhere myself because many people find photos of human remains offensive. I will describe it for you, though, because this photo is kind of the whole reason we're telling this story. Um, are they preserved heads? Yep, those are preserved heads. More than 30 Preserved human heads. Māori heads? Yeah. Lined up on a wall? Lined up on a wall. Horatio Robley is sitting in front of this wall. He's wearing a fancy suit, gold fob watch on a chain, giant waxed moustache, classic Victorian gentleman look. Really hard to just see a white guy sitting there with all these Māori heads on a wall behind him. In one hand, Robley's holding a Māori club, a mere you know, like a taonga for Māori, and he's holding it, and he's got all these heads, and some of them are just sitting on the seat or the thing that he's sitting on, like next to his kumu. It's really affronting. These preserved heads, the mokomokai, to give the Māori word, are pretty hard to look at. Some are well-preserved. You can still see their facial tattoos. The face is still recognisable. Hair's dressed. There's feathers in the hair. Others are more skull-like. Lips are drawn back from the teeth. The hair's fallen out. I mean, it's horrific. Could you imagine, could you imagine confronting that, you know, in, in, as, a, as a normal human being? What might be most disturbing is a couple of these heads look like they probably belong to children. One looks like it could be a baby's head. I, I can't imagine how anybody could collect the heads of human beings as artwork or otherwise, it's just, it's, it's inconceivable. You'll find this image all over the internet, usually on those slightly clickbaity websites full of weird or gruesome photos. But those websites usually don't explain how Horatio Robley collected these heads, whose heads they were, or maybe most importantly, why he collected them. Often it's just left to your imagination. Someone's not right there, is he? Like, um... It's a screw loose or a... Yeah. It's pretty confronting, isn't it? It's very confronting. <laughs> Fairly often you'll see people suggesting Rob Lee collected these heads in New Zealand while he was an officer in the British Army fighting against Māori and Tauranga in the 1860s. Some have even suggested he decapitated these people himself. It would be a simple matter for Rob Lee to sever the desired heads with his sabre and pay some Māori expert in the field, friendly to Europeans, to preserve them. That's from a newspaper feature written on Horatio Robley in the 1980s. To put it mildly, he's a man with a grim reputation. When you were younger, he was uh, described as a sort of a macabre predator of, of culture. But there's a twist in the story. Over time, as we've got to know him more and understand his motivation better, uh, we see now that I think he was um, really became a bit of a friend of the Māori. This is Hami Pitipi. He's a senior member of the Moko Mokai repatriation team at Te Papa Museum, which works to bring preserved Māori heads back from overseas to Aotearoa, New Zealand. And yeah, you heard him right. He says this guy, Horatio Robley, was a friend to Māori. 
Horatio Robley's a complicated guy. He's a soldier who took part in the most famous battle of New Zealand history, a man who had a child with the daughter of a sworn enemy, an artist whose paintings helped end a war, and an author whose book saved a treasured Māori art form from the brink of annihilation. And yet all most people will know about him as he's some weird old dude with a big moustache and a fancy suit who collected Māori heads. That image, more than any other, that's been the, the image people have of them. And I think what we see generally is people's projections of their own sense of what was going on onto the image. This is Tim Walker. He's a former senior curator at Te Papa who wrote his thesis on Horatio Robley. It's going to take us a while to get through that life story, so let's start at the beginning. Robley's born in Madeira, a set of small islands just off the coast of Portugal. It's 1840, just a few months after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand. There were British parents on both sides. His mother was part of a port company, you know, like Madeira Port, um, and his father was a retired um, captain from the British Indian Army. So a pretty typical upper-class British family. And when Robley's still pretty young, the family relocate to Britain, where he and his two sisters are homeschooled by their mother. Who was a well-known and published botanical artist in Madeira. She taught them art. Um, they had a, a, a private tutor, and Robley was taught by his father um, around shooting and boating. Both Robley's father and grandfather had served as officers in the West Indies, and he continues the trend. By age 18, he's a promising young officer with the 68th Durham Light Infantry, sailing for the British colony of Burma, these days also known as Myanmar. And you yeah, went out to Burma. Um, Burma was, it wasn't in a state of active warfare, it was like they, they were an occupying force. But this is the first place where we start to see there's something unusual about Horatio Robley. Something which doesn't quite fit the mould of a stereotypical young Victorian military officer. Whereas most of his colleagues were outside of military duties, like parade and so forth, they were playing cricket and having organising horse races and chasing tigers and things, Robley spent a great deal of his time with the Buddhist monks in the local monastery, effectively bartering for um, the monks to sit for him to allow a portrait to be taken. Horatio Robley, just like his mother, loved art. He was extremely talented at sketching and painting watercolours. I'm going to refer a lot to his artwork later on, and if you want to see it, there's a gallery up on our website. Rest assured, there's no human heads there. Anyway, to convince these Burmese monks to sit for portraits, Robley has to offer up something in return. And he was bartering by um, actually submitting himself to the marks of, of their, their tattooists. Over the next few years, Horatio Robley's arms and chest are completely covered in ink by these monks. You might think that's pretty weird for the time period, but there was actually a bit of a fashion craze for tattooing in Victorian high society. What is unusual is how this tattooing and Robley's painting builds genuine friendships. Quite a strong bond develops between him and the indigenous people he leaves with a, a Burmese signature. Um, he leaves with multiple tattoos down his arms and he leaves with a great deal of affection um, for, you know, on the part of those the, the Burmese monks. After six relatively peaceful years, the 68th Regiment's preparing to return to Britain. But at the last minute... The plan changes. While Robley's regiment was chilling out in Burma, war had broken out in New Zealand. British forces marched down the Great South Road from Auckland, invading the homeland of Waikato Māori. If you want to hear more about that war, then go back and take a listen to our episode about Thomas Russell. The super short version is that the governor of New Zealand, George Grey, wanted to crush the Māori King movement, and a lot of rich, powerful people in Auckland wanted to get hold of Māori land. Thousands of British soldiers sail for New Zealand, and one of them is Lieutenant Horatio Robley. He didn't know anything about New Zealand. They were fundamentally sent on here from Burma with no real kind of warning. 
Um, he gets to New Zealand um, in January 1864. He's the ensign carrier. He's a lieutenant by this stage. He's an ensign bearer for the regiment. Leads the regiment up Queen Street to Albert Barracks. Robley's unit must have been quite a sight as they marched up Queen Street. Aside from all the usual parade gear, the Durham Light Infantry have a mascot, a fully grown Burmese black bear. As soon as he's, um, they've settled into the um, tents, Robley goes into a bookshop in Shortland Street and buys two books by um, Judge Manning um, and also a Māori dictionary. Judge Manning's books were a sort of autobiography of his life as an early European settler living alongside Māori in Northland and becoming deeply embedded in Māori culture. The fact Robley bought this particular book when he arrived in New Zealand is very interesting. I think it shows that sense of intent, a sense that this is what he's going to engage in while he's here. That he wants to learn more about the about Indigenous Māori. people, yeah. Maybe he wanted to pick up a few more tattoos. In his memoir, he wrote that Burmese artists had blued much of me, but spaces were, however, ready for the delineation of Maori art. Unfortunately, Robley's time in New Zealand isn't going to be as peaceful as his deployment in Burma. By the time he arrives, the war against Waikato Tainui is pretty much over, so now Governor Gray finds a new target. He sets his sights on the Bay of Plenty, and in particular on Tauranga Harbour. Here's Buddy Makaere, a Tauranga Māori historian who's actually got a new book coming out on the Tauranga War. Basically what happened was that you had a close affiliation between the Tauranga iwi, like Ngāti Ranginui for example, with the Tainui iwi. So when the British invaded the Waikato in 1863, naturally you know, their allies from Tauranga went across to assist. Once the British had defeated um, the Tainui iwi, they then turned their attention to Tauranga and sent um, shiploads of troops and sailors and marines. You know, eventually you had an army built up in Tauranga around about 1,500, 1,600 men. One of those men is our man, Horatio Robley. Over the next few weeks, Tauranga Māori warriors return from Waikato and decide to build a new fortification, a pa called Pukehinehina, or as it's more commonly known by Pākehā, Gate Pa. And it's called the Gate Pa because it fundamentally was a pa built across an agreed gate between mission land and, and Māori land. So again, it was just an assertion of an agreed boundary. Today, Gate Pa is in a reserve on Cameron Road, just south of the town centre. A church was built on top of the Pa itself. It's the one next door to Mitre 10 Mega. Horatio Robley watches Gate Pa being built. He's in charge of the snipers who try to shoot Māori as they go down from the Pa to gather water. The natives so employed generally kept well under cover, and so only a few shots were obtained. But the sight of me in charge of the marksman and at work with my sketchbook drew some volleys from the enemy. Just a quick aside, I still have trouble getting over how obsessed this guy was with sketching. I mean, I quite enjoy drawing myself, but if I were in the middle of a war zone within shooting range of an enemy fort, I'd probably put down my pencil and paper for a while. Anyway, now Gate Pass complete and the British are ready for an assault. When morning dawned on Friday, 29th April 1864, heavy rain was falling and the sky was obscured by a murky atmosphere. The British forces are split. Robley, along with most of the other troops and the artillery, are at the front of the Pa. Around the back there's a smaller group of troops blocking the retreat and on either side there's a swampy estuary. At half past seven o'clock, the general officer commanding gave orders to open fire from the batteries. But the Māori who built Gate Pa played a trick. The British guns are aimed at the flagpole because the flagpole usually sits in the middle of a fort. But at Gate Pa, the builders put their flag several hundred metres behind the Pa. That meant the first few artillery shells went flying over the top and some of them even came crashing down on the British troops guarding the back entrance. When I was a lad, uh, people were still digging up bits of shells in their gardens 
actually, you know, way down in Greenton, which is way past where, um, where the power was. Somewhat astonishingly, nobody's killed, and the British correct their aim. Then they pound Gate Par with the heaviest artillery bombardment in New Zealand history. The evening was now wearing in. It was wet and fast becoming dark. So, General Cameron decided the time had arrived for the assault. During this time, the defenders had hardly fired a shot, and it was judged the bombardment had perhaps buried most of them in their earthworks. This judgment turns out to be dead wrong. The other genius of the par design was that trenches ex- um, extended beyond the palisade towards the oncoming troops and were covered over by our kodari, like our flax, twigs and, and, and bracken. And so what happened when the, um, the, the British, the, um, the New Zealand forces r- r- ran up the hill towards the par, they fell through into the hole and were shot. So there was a heavy loss of British life. The troops make it past the exterior trenches and run towards the narrow gap in the palisade. They crowd together as they push through the breach. In a space barely sufficient for the enemy was pouring in an ever-thickening crowd of our men who found themselves confronted with the unexpected. Inside the par, the grounds crisscross with trenches. And as the troops make it through the breach, they see Māori warriors rising up out of these pits, armed with loaded muskets. The rebels were there in force and far from annihilated. And from their fire pits discharged their weapons with murderous effect on a mark that was only too easy. In the first few volleys, all but one of the British officers are shot dead or mortally wounded. The troops are leaderless. There was a momentary lull, broken by an occasional shot, when our troops suddenly gave way. Some of them shouting, There's thousands of them! There's thousands of them! And rushed out through the breach, and, being without officers, never rallied. They were followed by the Maori fighters who poured into them a destructive fire. And as the fugitives failed to take cover, many were shot down as they fled. Slaughter, yeah. And so they'd fundamentally lost that battle and under cover of darkness... Uh, Māori left down a kind of a um, gully towards the sea and and moved away. And I think even through that night, the British were shooting at each other. They heard things and were shooting, but they actually shot one or two of their own Hmm. um, people as the Māori escaped. The Battle of Gate Par ends with 35 British troops killed and 75 wounded. Māori casualties are estimated at about half that number. But... That night, after the battle, something unusual happens. Some of the Māori chiefs were extremely devout Christians, and they made a point of showing mercy to the wounded British left behind on the battlefield. Well, I'm not quite sure if there is a natural link, but people talk about it as being a forerunner to the Geneva Convention. So after um, the main engagement and when night came, um, there's lots of soldiers and officers lying around the battlefield wounded, um, badly wounded, and calling out for water. And during the night, people uh, take them water and um, give them assistance. One of the families in our hapu, the Hall family, one of the daughters at the time took her horse down, and she was um, picking up wounded soldiers and carrying them into the British camp. Um, to the hospital there. I think she did it for two of them. But by the time she got back for the third one, it was it was dark. And so she thought, wandering around the dark, she'd probably like you to get, get challenged and maybe killed. So she took the soldier home. 
and looked after him there. And then um, he ended up marrying her. And uh, so that whole family um, is descended from that soldier. The mercy of Māori towards their British enemies is one of the most famous parts of Gate Pa. But it wasn't all one way. A British Army surgeon called William Manley won the Victoria Cross for saving the lives of British and Māori alike. And the next day, after Māori had retreated from the Pa, Horatio Robley did his bit to help the wounded Māori who had been left behind. By daylight, I had entered the works from the rear and gave assistance to the wounded Māori. Having a plentiful ration of rum with me, I was able to administer some of this to them. So, Horatio Robley is wandering around Gate Pa, dead and dying Māori all around him. You might think this is the point where he whips out his sword and starts chopping off heads, like was suggested in that newspaper article we read out a bit earlier on. But actually, Robley won't start collecting heads for another 20 years. We will get to that, I promise. Instead, he does something which you might find even more strange. He starts drawing pictures of these dead and dying Māori. I remember while sketching them how curiously they looked at me, perhaps wondering what use the Pākehā soldier would make of it. Now, if I were a wounded warrior and some enemy officer came along and started drawing pictures of me, I'd look at them pretty strangely too. Again, this guy is just obsessed with sketching. But these sketches might be the most extraordinary part of Robley's story because these drawings of dead and dying Māori at Gate Pa might have helped bring an end to this chapter of the New Zealand Wars. The defeat at Gate Pa was a huge scandal for the British. Yes, there was no hiding the fact of what had happened. This is Patricia Brooks, a local historian in Tauranga. It was brutally obvious to the whole world that the Māori had the upper hand in this engagement. And if the dry facts of the defeat at Gate Pa weren't enough, the British public also got to see the carnage in vivid detail. That's because Horatio Robley sent his sketches and paintings to the London Illustrated News. And alongside these sketches, the newspaper carries a front-page editorial slamming the war in New Zealand. It is impossible to talk away the fact that the real cause of war is to be found in the coveting of their neighbour's land by the English settlers. That territorial lust which we denounce in Frenchmen, Germans and Russians, but to which we give free licence when we come in contact with a brown man. And that's a pretty strong line for, yes. a, for a London newspaper to take at that time. Yes, because it wouldn't have been the popular line if one was supporting war efforts and then all of a sudden they're turning around and saying, well, hey, perhaps this is a, an undisguised land grab. It's sort of a weird role for Robley to play. I mean, he's not a journalist. He's a soldier in the British Army. I mean, it seems almost sort of him going against his own cause to, to be sort of sending these um, images you have to credit him with great honesty. He certainly wasn't um, propping up the British. He was showing it as it was. I want to be a bit careful here because it's not like Robley's some kind of white knight who's actively trying to subvert the British war effort. In fact, his memoirs suggest he was quite proud of the part he played in this conflict. But whether it's intentional or not, his sketches played into an existing unease about the war in New Zealand. The British public and the British government were already deeply unhappy about the war. It was costing an enormous amount of money and lives and wasn't providing any real benefit to anyone back in London. The only people profiting were a few rich land speculators in Auckland who were buying up all this confiscated land. To me, it's a bit like photos from the Vietnam War or Abu Ghraib prison. Just like those images, Robley's sketches galvanise existing opposition to the war in New Zealand. They must have had a powerful effect. You know, a picture says a thousand words, and I think the pictures were portraying the terrible cost of the war to the Maori in New Zealand, and British people just thought it wasn't fair. Eventually, authorities take action. The Secretary of State for the Colonies writes to Governor George Grey, saying... 10,000 English troops had been placed at your disposal for objects of great imperial concern and not for the attainment of any merely local object. 
you will not continue the expenditure of blood and treasure longer than is absolutely necessary for the establishment of a just and enduring peace. Spoiler alert, a just and enduring peace is not what happens. And Gate Pa isn't the last battle Horatio Robley witnesses between Māori and the British. Plus, we haven't even told you how or why Horatio Robley collected those preserved Māori heads. That's all coming in part two of Headhunter, the story of Horatio Robley. Thanks very much for listening, and don't forget to tell your friends to listen to Black Sheep. Also, subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode of the upcoming season. And if you're looking for other great RNZ podcasts to listen to, you can find them all over the place. You can search in your favourite podcast app, or you can go to rnz.co.nz, go to the podcast page, and have a look through there. One really good one I'll recommend is Beyond Kate. 125 years on from women winning the right to vote, Sonia Sly looks at the battles of the past and how some of those battles are still being fought today. Very special thanks to Tim Walker, Buddy McKayre, Harmi Pitipi and Patricia Brooks. For more about Gate Parr and the Tauranga War, you should really check out Buddy's book. If it's not out already by the time you're listening to this, it should be published very soon. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. This episode was engineered by Mark Chesterman and Phil Benge. The executive producer was Tim Watkin. We had voice acting help from Duncan Smith, Adam McCauley and Colin Peacock. <laughs>